there was a time when geek was a mortal insult. Or at least a serious one. Goddamn geek! And the comic book fans of yore heard this word a lot. Yet today, comic book stories have taken over our screens and become just another part of our lives. What happened? Welcome to Watch Mojo's series, How Geek Culture Became Pop Culture. Once niche and ridiculed, geek culture has exploded into the mainstream. How did so much change? Join us as we look at how pulp fiction, comics, video games, anime, and nerd heroes became pop culture staples. For our finale, DC vs. Marvel Part 2, we'll be covering the rise of superhero movies and shared universes from the 90s onward. I'm sorry, you're saying there's a multiverse? In our last episode of DC vs. Marvel, DC had a stronghold on superhero movies. Marvel was struggling to even make a watchable movie, and Batman had punched a shark while dangling from a helicopter. <laughs> Will comics finally earn the respect they deserve? Can DC keep up its big screen winning streak? Will Marvel ever get its act together? Is shark repellent spray real? Hand me down the shark repellent bat spray. Stay tuned to find out. It's surreal to think that Marvel, now one of the most recognizable names in media, seemed to be on its last legs in the 90s. In 1992, Marvel lost several of its most prominent talents. Todd McFarlane, Eric Larson, Jim Lee, Rob Liefeld, Wills Portacio, Mark Silvestri, and Jim Valentino, who left to form Image Comics. Marvel kicked off 1996 by letting 275 employees go, and capped off the year filing for bankruptcy. Mr. President, thanks. To stay afloat, Marvel sold the rights to several heroes, including the X-Men, Fantastic Four, and Spider-Man. Spider-Man! Cool. Tell us, why are you here? None of your business! While the future of Marvel was up in the air, DC was having trouble replicating the success of 1989's Batman. Batman. After Batman Returns proved too dark to promote Happy Meals, The Dark Knight was made more lighthearted in Batman Forever, and the franchise collapsed into itself with Batman and Robin. The Iceman cometh. Meanwhile, Steel was an ill-fated attempt to make Shaq a superhero. It's hammer time. And that Nicolas Cage Superman reboot just couldn't get off the ground. That's kind of neat because it kind of has like a velvet look to it. It's like a child. Like Comic book movies appear to be box office poison by the end of the 90s. Well, it is important to have dreams, I guess. Until two films showed otherwise. Men in Black was the third highest grossing film of 1997, making comic book movies look pretty damn good again. You know what the difference is between you and me? I make this look good. The Men in Black was originally published by Air Cell Comics, which was purchased by Malibu Comics, only to be bought by Marvel. So MIB was sort of like a stepchild, whereas 1998's Blade had Marvel's own blood surging through its veins. Although not a blockbuster, the film's R-rated violence, stylish visuals, and Wesley Snipes' dead-on portrayal breathed new life into the superhero genre. However, the modern age of comic book movies wouldn't truly take off until the new century. Released by Fox in 2000, X-Men changed everything for comics, cinema, geek culture, and pop culture. You actually go outside in these things? What would you prefer? Yellow spandex? Opening with a flashback of a young Eric Lencher during the Holocaust, the film set a mature tone from the get-go. After several years of mostly misfires, X-Men reminded audiences that superhero movies could be sophisticated, atmospheric, and even thought-provoking. And I will always be there, old friend. Above all else, it demonstrated Marvel's box office potential, grossing almost $300 million. After X-Men hit at the box office, all the studios started buying up every comic property they could get their dirty little hands on. X-Men might have gotten the ball rolling again, but superhero fever really set in after 2002's Spider-Man. From the amazing Spider-Man TV series to that amazingly bizarre Japanese series, many had assumed Spidey would never be done justice in live action. 
If Superman made us believe that a man could fly, then Spider-Man made us believe that anything was possible in this modern era of filmmaking. Who are you? You know who I am. I do. Your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. With a box office total of $825 million, Spider-Man became the year's biggest film, setting a new precedent for superheroes and summer blockbusters. Spider-Man 2 delved even deeper into the psychology of being a superhero. At the time, Roger Ebert called the Spidey sequel, quote, the best superhero movie ever made. You have a train to catch. Just as comic book movies appeared to hit their stride, however, the genre went through another awkward transitional period. Whatever you say. For every Sin City or V for Vendetta, there was a Catwoman or League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Well, this is nice. Daredevil, Fantastic Four, and Ghost Rider while financially successful, received mixed to negative responses and struggled to ignite franchises. <laughs> Even the X-Men and Spider-Man films were losing touch with their fan bases thanks to emo Peter and mouthless Deadpool. Wait, is that you? Fortunately, in 2008, comic book movies not only got back on track, but emerged stronger than ever before. Now there's a Batman. The Dark Knight was Christopher Nolan's anticipated follow-up to Batman Begins, which grounded the titular hero in a gritty reality that paralleled our own. What the hell are you? I'm Batman. Nolan's sequel took this one step further, earning a reputation as one of the greatest modern superhero movies, if not the greatest. No. No. No, you, you complete me. There was an outcry among audiences and critics alike when the film wasn't nominated for Best Picture at the Academy Awards. It's not about what I want. It's about what's fair! Heath Ledger did win a posthumous Oscar, though, for his transcendent performance as the Joker. You know, you remind me of my father. I hated my father. The Dark Knight may have been 2008's biggest blockbuster, but the year's second highest grossing film domestically had an even more significant impact. Iron Man was not only a comeback for its star, Robert Downey Jr., but for Marvel movies as well. There was zero doubt that the film would inspire a trilogy, but Marvel Studios president Kevin Feige had even grander ideas in mind. Mr. Stark, you become part of a bigger universe. As hinted in a post credit scene, Iron Man was intended to be the launching point for a Marvel Cinematic Universe. The venture seemed destined to fail for a variety of reasons. Here you have an unusual problem. You should talk. Namely, several of Marvel's most popular characters were tied up in other studio contracts. Marvel still had a few well-known heroes under their umbrella, but would people really line up to see movies centered on the Hulk, Thor, and Captain America, especially after their previous live-action interpretations? I'm like this all day. The answer was a resounding yes. As the Avengers prepared to assemble, Marvel formed a game-changing partnership with Disney. How quickly can we buy this building? The latest phase in their plot to take over the world, or at least the entertainment world, the Mouse House acquired Marvel for $4.24 billion in 2009. Ferb, are you expecting someone? Not them. While some comic book fans feared that their favorite heroes would be Disney-fied, Marvel prospered like never before under its new parent company. After the Avengers opened in 2012 to record numbers, shared universe crossovers went from a crazy idea to the new norm. If it's all the same to you, I'll have that drink now. DC would try to catch up to the MCU with a cinematic universe of their own, with varying results. Boys! Mm. Bruce Wayne meets Clark Kent. I love it. I love bringing people together. Between the highs of Wonder Woman and Shazam, the lows of Suicide Squad, and the rock bottom of that Martha moment, the DCEU remains a mixed bag. Why did you say that name? Meanwhile, the MCU, even at its weakest, has yet to produce a genuine bomb. Extinction. The MCU has become the most successful film franchise ever, popularizing comic book heroes for all audiences. Even once obscure properties like Guardians of the Galaxy are now household names. We're the Guardians of the Galaxy. Marvel's winning streak culminated in 2019's Avengers Endgame, the highest grossing film of all time.
Although some have argued that superheroes are a passing trend, for now, they continue to diversify and win new audiences. Oh! Oh, hello! From R-rated comedies like Deadpool, to socially relevant TV shows like Watchmen, to Best Picture nominees like Black Panther and Joker, the genre has never been more dominant or varied. Streaming services and shared TV universes like the MCU's and the Arrowverse have ensured that comic book heroes are in every home. Marv, M-A-R-V, you're welcome. And Marv, as far as you know, how long have Supergirl and I and all the, the rest of us um, been working together on this Earth? Uh, since forever? This popularity has extended to screen adaptations of other comic book genres, graphic novels, and manga. Entire YouTube channels are dedicated to superhero content. Welcome to Watch Mojo. Yeah. yeah, that's me. Hey. Oh no way! Oh no you way! Never you never did it? Oh my god! You Can you do the Watch intro Mojo. for us? Right now, oh, really? please. I, never... Comment sections and internet forums give fans another way to connect, and of course, debate. Once based on letters and fanzines and later cons, fandom is now much more nebulous and diverse. Essentially, just a click away. That's what this review says. Wait, you wrote this one. But what does the sudden rise to fame and glory mean for geek culture? Is it even geek culture anymore? For nearly a century, comics and superheroes belonged to the nerdy crowd. The net has since been cast much wider thanks to film, television, and the internet. Whereas many geeks are happy they're no longer being marginalized, others have concerns that they've lost a piece of their culture. Corporations make billions off of nerd culture, making outsiders like the new insiders, leaving the truly odd with no way to self-identify. In a 2018 article for Wired titled Wake Up Geek Culture, Time to Die, actor and comedian Patton Oswalt complained that the internet, quote, lets anyone become otaku about anything instantly. In the 80s, you couldn't get up to speed on an entire genre in a weekend. We were so excited when they did that massive JLA, Avengers, Freddy, Saw, Predators, Aliens, Hangover 4 mashup movie. If we'd only known that it was going to create the pop culture mind sink that it did. Journalist Noam Cohen made a similar point with the title of his article, We're All Nerds Now. Where the relative popularity of the label geek has caused some who identify with the term to try and protect it from more casual fandom, this often causes rifts in the comic-loving community, where fans with a passing interest in comics and superheroes are ostracized by those who stake a larger claim to these properties. Are you sure you haven't seen the show? Yeah, cause I'm not a 12-year-old girl. Software engineer David Auerbach argues that this mentality can have a negative impact, writing, quote, at its worst, real geek culture results in a dangerous elitism, the notion that you're so much smarter and better than society that you can do without it. In a way, the evolution of geek culture parallels the evolution of superheroes. Mr. Moore, will you sign my DVD of Watchmen Babies? Which of the babies is your favorite? You see what those bloody corporations do? In the old days, you could tell somebody was a hero based on their costume and physique, not unlike how geeks were supposedly defined by glasses and squeaky voices. There's one thing we know, it is science. And math. And the worst every Monty Python routine. Our ideas about heroes and geeks have become more nuanced since then. Heroes can do bad things, and villains can have understandable motivations. Y'all sitting up here comfortable. The archetypes who used to pick on people for reading comics now show up to Marvel movies on opening night. Meanwhile, people who once embraced everything geeky have grown increasingly critical of their own culture now that it's mainstream. Attention, comic book aficionados! This man is not one of us! He has a girlfriend! Point being, geek culture has evolved beyond a simple label. Face the facts, has been. This man is the comic book guy our town deserves. This diversification is reflected in comics themselves. These days, you name it, there's a comic about it. From fairy tale characters in New York, to love and prejudice in space, to war refugees and inner demons. The definition of geek culture is bound to keep changing over time, for better or worse. For now, the spectrum of geekdom casts a wider net than ever before, ranging all the way from the casual moviegoer to the intensely devoted comic historian. Whichever part of the spectrum you fall on, comics continue to provide the life force for geek culture. And that won't be changing anytime soon. We hope you've enjoyed the series. If you missed any episodes, click the link to go back and watch.